Hi, Anike. Um, hi, everyone. So last week, I spent three days at the ETF Exchange Conference in Miami, along with my colleagues, Brendan McCauley and Anikit Lal, who's joining me here today, CFRA's head of ETF data and analytics. Um, first, thanks to Todd Rosenbluth and the entire Vetify team. It was a great conference down to every last detail. We had really engaging conversations with ETF issuers, advisors, and other ETF industry experts. So we thought it would be helpful for Anika and I to do a brief recap of the three days we spent there um, and touch on some of the key themes that were addressed during the conference. Absolutely, Michael. It was a really great event. Uh, enjoyed spending time with you. And of course, we got to meet so many industry participants, like you said. It almost felt like an industry reunion, you know, meeting various advisors, ETF issuers, and it's just such a great way to really find out what people are talking about, what's topical in the industry, the new trends, the kind of ETFs um, investors are focused on and so on. So it is a really great event and a great opportunity to reconnect and, and talk about trends in the industry right now. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. So what was your, your overall impression of the conference, you know, in, in terms of a, a big theme or takeaway from the event? Well, I've been attending this event for a few years now, and if there was one theme I'd take away, it was how sophisticated the industry has become. Uh, Michael, as you know, this is the 30th year since of the ETF industry in the US. It's been 30 years since SPY, the first ETF in the US launched. And in some ways, it felt very appropriate because if we look at how the ETF industry has evolved, started with very plain vanilla beta, uh, then evolved into smart beta, you know, thematic exposure, factor exposure. And this year, I would say we saw a lot more discussion around more complex strategies, particularly options-based strategies. I think was, there was a lot of discussion around tickers like JEPI, which is, you know, uses covered call strategies to generate income, as well as strategies that use options for defined outcome, more structured product type ETFs. So if there's one takeaway or theme for me from this year's conference, it was how sophisticated the industry has become and how we've moved away from just pure plain vanilla beta exposure. Now, that hasn't gone away. We know the majority of assets are still in traditional indexed products, but this industry certainly evolved away from just those products. Sure. Another thing I noticed was the discussions we had around active ETFs. There seemed to be a lot of optimism around the growth of ETFs in general, but more specifically around active ETFs. Do you agree with that observation? Absolutely. There's certainly a lot of optimism around, optimism around active ETFs. What was interesting to me, Michael, you may recall, we sat in the session with the CEO of Vanguard where he talked about Vanguard's strategy. And it was really interesting to me that even a firm like Vanguard talked so much about active. You know, we associate Vanguard typically with index products. And the CEO was very careful to emphasize that Vanguard wasn't just about indexing. They actually had roots in active management when Bogle first started the fund or the firm. And, you know, they really see themselves as bringing low cost to all aspects of investment management, whether it's indexing or active. And so the fact that Vanguard itself associates itself not just with indexing, but also with active tells me that the industry is moving in that direction. Certainly, if you look at our ETF data that we maintain within CFRA, we've seen a lot of flows, a lot of assets into active in the last year or two. And I think that's a space to keep, to keep an eye on. Definitely. Another noticeable trend at the event was the presence of some of the big traditional mutual fund firms that we spoke to that are now looking to expand their ETF footprint. It seems clear that the traditional mutual fund firms are, are looking to commit more resource, resources to the, uh, the ETF space. Uh, th that's right. And, and, you know, as we talk to a lot of ETF issuers, it's clear that some of them have come from the mutual fund world and they're grappling and thinking about how to transition to the new world of ETFs. For them, it's still a relatively new space. And we've seen even within our data that there's been an increasing number of mutual fund to ETF conversions. We estimated last year that there's about $40 billion in assets that have converted from mutual funds to ETFs. We project that number could get maybe not a 70, 80 billion, even close to 100 billion in assets this year. And so that's certainly an important trend for us to monitor. And as we talk to the ETF issuers, it's clear that this is a complex problem for them to address. 
you know, there's so many things they need to think about, whether it's a potential revenue loss from their existing funds, channel conflicts, and so on. And so it's going to be interesting to see how these ETF issuers navigate the transition from mutual funds to the ETF world. But certainly something we're going to see accelerate. And it wouldn't surprise me to see a lot more ETF conversions happen this year and into the next year. And that'll make for even more interesting conversations at next year's conference. Um, international investing seemed like another big area of focus. We heard keynote sessions by experts like Ian Bremmer from the Eurasia Group. Uh, what was your take on the prospects for global investing? I was actually surprised, uh, well, maybe not entirely surprised, but it was certainly um, clear that there's a lot of interest in international investing right now. Uh, the 2022, we saw what happened. The dollar was extremely strong. And when that happens, that puts a lot of pressure on um, you know, emerging markets because a lot of their debt may be denominated in dollars. They may be importing oil and other commodities that are again dollar denominated. And of course, when you translate local returns in international markets back into dollars, a strong dollar tends to offset those returns. And so for all of these reasons, a strong dollar last year was a very challenging year for, for emerging markets. In particular, we saw EEM, the kind of the emerging markets index down uh, in the range of almost 20%. This year looks very different. It's very clear that there's a lot more interest in, in international markets. Uh, dollars not projected to be as strong this year. And so I think that's why we saw a lot of discussion around um, international investing. Certainly there are some geopolitical risks. Uh, Ian Bremer referred to some of them like in the Ukraine-Russia conflict and so on. But in general, there seems to be a lot more interest in, in, in international markets, particularly emerging markets. And there are a few markets in particular, I think investors are paying attention to. China is reopened now post their very strict COVID lockdown. We're seeing an interesting demographic story in India where you know it's going to surpass China as the most populated country in the world and therefore may get you know huge working population that could add to productivity. So I think all of these factors together have driven interest in international markets. And I think that is a big theme of the event for sure. Well, staying with that macro theme, we had some interesting sessions around the economic environment. I think from our conversations, our favorite was with um, with David Kelly from JP Morgan. He seemed concerned about the Fed's current path of, of raising rates. He, he had some very interesting data. I think he made a very compelling case that maybe the Fed is being too aggressive um, in, in raising rates. Of course, we saw inflation data come out um, very recently now, which indicates maybe it's not moderating as much as people expected. He essentially argued that the main component of inflation that's still high is wages. And he seemed to indicate that, um, you know, maybe um, the Fed is being too aggressive in, in its rate hiking cycle. It's hard to say how things are going to play out. He did kind of indicate that whatever happens, we seem to be headed more towards a shallow recession rather than a very deep, prolonged recession. Um, he kind of likened it more to entering a swamp, which is kind of prolonged, but but uh, kind of shallow. And so that that was certainly um, interesting to listen to and, and seemed to be in line with the consensus we've been hearing from other economists uh, at some of the other banks as well. Sure. I think that, that recaps a lot of the, the conversations that we had. So any final thoughts on the conference? I thought it was a great event. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, I think the things you mentioned were certainly um, interesting, active, you know, conversions to uh, ETFs, international investing, and so on. Um, overall, you know, it just shows that the space is getting more complicated. It's getting more complex. And some of the work we've been doing, you know, in terms of publishing granular ETF data, being able to screen the ETF universe in different ways. Once you, that data is screened, being able to look at the underlying holdings and then rating ETFs based on those underlying holdings. In my view, all of that work is getting more important because as we mentioned, the complexity of ETFs is going up, the size of the universe is growing, flows are accelerating. And in that environment, advisors, investors, industry professionals need data and tools to kind of evaluate and make sense of all those changes. So I'm excited about the work we're doing. I was certainly happy to be at the conference with you, Michael, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the work we're doing in the ETF space. Great. Thanks, Anikit.